Neural networks based on the transformer architecture have achieved state-of-the-art performance on language modeling and many other tasks. So let's take a look at some of the core ideas behind transformers, including how they're built from self-attention blocks, and how they combine some of the best aspects of their recurrent and residual network predecessors. Recurrent neural networks are good at text processing because they receive word embeddings as input and then will process a sequence of words, gradually building up a hidden state that over time will come to represent the information content of a document. And they can be trained to do this using readily available data, using simple unsupervised tasks like predict the next word in a sentence. But recurrent networks, even LSTMs, tend to struggle with long inputs because the data has to be passed through the layers so many times. On the other hand, residual networks are great at handling data that passes through many, many layers because the residual connections mean that each block only needs to augment the input and that gradients have a shorter path to follow, both of which simplify training of deep networks. Another advantage of residual networks when applied for image processing is that they can use convolution within the residual blocks, meaning that the architecture gives a leg up on the sorts of functions that are likely to be useful for image processing. So we'd like some way of combining the advantages in processing text of recurrent networks with the advantages in learning deep models of residual networks, and that leads us to the transformer. Much like a recurrent network, a transformer operates on word embeddings, but unlike a recurrent network that receives words one at a time, a transformer receives all of the embeddings for an entire document concatenated together into a matrix, where every row is the embedding of a different word. And like recurrent networks, a transformer can be trained on unsupervised prediction of missing words to produce an encoding of a document that can be used for all sorts of natural language processing tasks. But from residual networks, the transformer inherits skip connections that mean each block only needs to augment its predecessors, and that gradients can propagate quickly through even a large network. But to do text processing, we need a very different sort of architecture within the blocks, and the key idea for setting up the architecture within the blocks so that it's easy for the network to learn useful functions is known as self-attention. Self-attention is the idea that in text processing, to understand one word in a sentence, we have to pay attention to other words that might be far away in the sentence, but maybe we can learn how to pay attention to the right things. As an example of what we mean, consider this sentence from one of my favorite deep learning papers, on debiasing word embeddings. When we read the sentence, the analogies generated from these embeddings spell out the bias implicit in the data on which they were trained. We encounter at the end of the sentence the pronoun they. And grammatically, that pronoun can refer back to any of the noun phrases appearing earlier in the sentence. But as speakers of English with a little knowledge of deep learning, we can infer that since they are being trained, that refers back to the embeddings. And so understanding the end of the sentence requires us to think back to context that was established earlier. And so for a neural network to do good natural language processing, we'd like to set up its architecture to help it with that sort of identification of what should it be paying attention to to figure out what's happening later in the sentence. So the idea of self-attention is 
for each word, we'd like to figure out which other words in the document should it be paying attention to, to really understand the meaning. But as was the case when we talked about convolution, we're not going to explicitly engineer a specific attention function into the network. Rather, we are going to set up the architecture in a way that seems like it makes that type of function easy to learn. If it's possible to learn this sort of thing, where for each word we can figure out what other parts of the document are most important to understanding its meaning, and if that were the output of our blocks, then that would be a great way to enhance the word embeddings and produce a good encoding of the entire document. So it would be great if we could calculate this self-attention, but in general we don't know how to do that. But maybe we can set up the architecture of our blocks in a way that facilitates learning this style of function. So let's think about the architecture within the first of these self-attention encoder blocks. The first block in the network receives all of the word embeddings as its input, and for each of those words for which it has an embedding, it computes three different dense layers. Those dense layers are called Q, K, and V for query, key, and value. And we have the same set of three dense layers being applied to every word in the document. Like with convolution, all of the query layers for every single word share the same weights. They are just being applied to different elements of the input sentence. From here, the idea is that we can take a dot product between the query and key vectors to assess similarity. As we know from linear algebra, when we take the dot product of two vectors, that value will be large if the vectors point in roughly the same direction, and the dot product will be small if those vectors point in very different directions. So, if the query and key vectors that we got from the dense layers are similar, then we will get a large value when we compute their dot product. Here I've shown the dot product between the query and key vectors for the same word, but we'll also take the dot product between the query vector for the word analogies and the key vector for each of the other words. And so we'll get a vector of similarity scores between the query vector for this word and the key vectors for every other word. We don't know exactly what the q and k vectors mean because they are the result of a dense layer calculation that will be trained by gradient descent, but if the q and k layers are extracting some kind of useful information about every word, then we can assess the similarity between this word's q vector and all of the other k's. Then we can apply a softmax to convert those similarity scores to values between 0 and 1 that emphasize the most similar of the vectors. So this vector represents for all of the keys which are most similar to the query for the word analogies. And we can use that to say what should we pay attention to when evaluating the word analogies. And the way we actually pay attention is we'll use those softmax weights as multipliers on all of the value vectors for every word in the document. So now we take each of the vectors that were the output of the value dense layers. And each of these vectors gets multiplied element-wise with the corresponding entry 
in the softmax vector. So whatever similarity score we calculated between the query for analogies and the key for embeddings will be multiplied by the value vector for embeddings. So we are taking all of these value vectors and performing a weighted sum according to how much attention we want to pay. And this gives us an output vector that was computed from all of the values in the document, but weighted by how much we decided to pay attention to each of them on the word analogies. And this whole structure is being applied in parallel for each of the words. So we will also use the query vector for embeddings to compute similarities with all of the key vectors and then take a softmax and apply that to all of the values to get our output vector for embeddings and an output vector for they and for all of the other words in the input. And the result when we squish all of these vectors together is a matrix where every row is calculated from the entire document according to how much attention we wanted to pay for that word. And we will now add this information that came from the entire document onto the original embedding. So we have now taken the original words and added to each word content that came from the entire document, but based on how we decided to pay attention to the different parts of the document. From there, we'll apply a regular dense layer of matching shape, and this gives the output of one attention head. But, much like we want many channels in a convolutional layer, we often want many attention heads within a given encoder block. And so, all of this gets duplicated for however many attention heads we have, and then at the end we can take the output of all the different attention heads and add them up, as our output of the block, which can then be combined with the skip connection that goes around the block. And so by taking a dot product of query and key vectors and applying a softmax to produce the weights that we will use to sum up the value vectors, we set the network up with an architecture that allows it to learn based on the weights it finds for these dense layers what it wants to pay attention to in each of the attention heads, and because it has several different attention heads, it can learn to pay attention to different things under different circumstances, and combine all of those different attention calculations to augment the input representation into a useful encoding of a text document. Once we produce this sort of encoding, there are lots of things we could do. Most straightforwardly, we could just apply some additional layers to the encoding to produce a classification output. But it turns out that this encoding often contains enough information that we can do way more, such as machine translation. If we use this network to produce an encoding of a document in English, and we want to translate that to some other language, we can use this encoding as the input to another neural network. And this was in fact the problem for which the transformer architecture was originally proposed. And that paper described, in addition to this sequence of encoder blocks, a sequence of additional self-attention blocks that serve as the decoder to produce output in another language. And translation is a great task for training language models, because if we want to translate text from one language to another, we really have to understand a lot about the meaning of that text. And so the first transformers were trained on performing encoding in one language 
and then decoding with similar self-attention layers in another language. But we can also do unsupervised training of transformers, much like we would with a recurrent architecture. Only with a transformer, we can't ask it to predict the next word because it sees the whole input at once. And the solution here is to train the network on documents where some of the words have been randomly blanked out. If we leave out a few words from the input, then, much like with recurrent networks, we can ask the model to produce those missing words as output, and by gradient descent training, force it to come up with an encoding that is good enough to make at least a reasonable guess as to what the missing words might have been. One issue that I've glossed over so far is that the architecture here has no inherent understanding of which words are near one another in the sentence. And the ordering and proximity of words is often very important to understanding language. So as part of the input to the network, we need to give it some information about where the words are. And that is done via a positional encoding. The positional encoding will be a matrix of the same size as the input embedding. And when we add it to the input, it will modify each line in a way that is unique to that position in the text. And there are a number of different ways of producing positional embeddings, some of which have been manually engineered and some of which have been learned. But as long as we give the network some useful information about position, then it can learn things that are dependent on word ordering or word proximity. What I've shown you here, while plenty complicated on its own, is just an introduction to transformers. And there are lots of variations on transformers that use encoders or decoders separately, or both together, and train on all kinds of different data sets to solve tons of interesting problems, both in natural language processing and in many other areas of deep learning.